some kind we should see the uh, information that the meeting is being recorded. And then I'm going to go ahead and open up the PDF for um, chapter one. Okay, and uh, so you want to have this in front of you either in hard copy, you know, right out of your textbook like this, right? or print these out and have the pages available if you haven't received the book yet. Okay, you can do one of these numbers for some of the material, print that out. Or you could have your uh, tablet in front of you and mark up the pages as we go, because I am going to be uh, highlighting. I'm going to be indicating flashcard suggestions as we go. And the idea is that you want to mark up your book accordingly as I go through this. Uh, remember, we're preparing for an exam here. And so it's nice to have your book marked up in a manner that's going to allow you to then take the information, extract the information from the book, turn it into flashcards, use those flashcards to uh, learn the material in preparation for your exam. Now, uh, in the event that you, um, well, I shouldn't say in the event because it came with your package, there's the Becker flashcards as well. Uh, if I suggest a flashcard and you find a card in the pre-made Becker cards that um, are equivalent to what I'm suggesting, then you don't have to sit there and write out a separate card. Um, but if there's a card that I suggest and you don't see something equivalent in the Becker flashcards, then you're going to want to um, get yourself a set of three by five cards, come up with a question that you ask yourself on the blank side, write the short answer on the line side. So it's always a short question, a short answer. Sometimes I tell folks a flashcard and then I'll look at their flashcards and they just rewrite everything the book said in that section on a card. It's no quick question, quick answer as we start to gear our response, our brains to responding quickly to certain stimulus that we'll see in a question that allow us to answer that question. Okay, question about the flashcards. Okay, all right, good. So let's just go ahead then with all that and uh, let's take a look at the outline and uh, internal control frameworks, they say, and then it turns out that there's only one framework. It's going to be the COSO framework, the framework that was contemplated by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission. If you took the auditing class here with me last time, uh, there's gonna be a certain amount of deja vu for you on this in that um, we have uh, seen this in the auditing uh, course, in okay, the auditing exam. Um, the only difference is that now we're gonna be looking at it from the standpoint of management as opposed to the standpoint of auditors. About five points on that, if any, if, if even that many, okay? Not something that the uh, BEC exam goes heavily into, okay? Uh, what had happened though, the committee and sponsoring organizations of the, of the, at that point it wasn't of the Treadway Commission, but the committee of sponsoring organizations a few years ago said, well, since we've contemplated an internal control structure, maybe we can contemplate a structure for enterprise risk management, okay? That also is something that's probably gonna be about five points, not real heavy uh, on the exam, but uh, something we wanna be aware of. Um, you know, risk management is always funny because to me, um, you know, I think uh, students can tend to contemplate, oh, there's these things that can happen out here and we're gonna try to avoid all of these things from happening. And the reality of risk management is it assumes that a bad thing's going to happen. And how do you manage the bad effects of that bad thing? That's really the way we're gonna look at that. And I'll talk to you more about that, okay? Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, we're going to talk about it a little bit. And uh, you're aware that Sarbanes-Oxley uh, created the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And what we talk about in the auditing class is how those standards apply, they, the PCALB right standards that apply to audits of public companies. Here, 
we're looking more at the parts of Sarbanes-Oxley and how they relate to board of directors and management of an entity. So with the internal control and the Sarbanes-Oxley, it's going to sound very familiar to you if you've already gone through the auditing material, uh, but the spin is from the standpoint of the entity, the standpoint of management, as opposed to the standpoint of the auditors. Uh, business processes is something that is new to the 20, uh, July 1st, 2021 exam. It's a little annoying in that it is very descriptive. I'm thinking also a five point area here. And I'm hoping to get through modules one through four this, after, uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, financial management is going to be 10 points and uh, we'll probably have to wait until next time uh, to get through those two sections. Now, you look at this and you say, well, 5, 10, 15, 20, uh, another 10, 30 points in this one chapter. Now, there's potential of 30 points in this one chapter. That doesn't mean I'm not indicating to you here that the examiners will absolutely ask you five points of this, 10 points of that. I'm telling relative weights to the uh, amount of points that they select from. They may only have two points of this. They may only have six points of financial management on your exam to compile the 100 points, but at least, at least this point value give you a sense as to how much you can expect in these different areas. That doesn't mean that you can ignore, so when John says five points, so I should ignore that. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just giving you a relative sense as to how heavily the examiners tend to get into one area versus the other. Okay, question on that? All right, good. So let's go ahead then if there are no questions on the points. And let's start to take a look at module one. Now, the way the book is uh, structured is they give you modules and then the modules, remember we talked about uh, last time, line up with your homework. And so once you've gone through and you've understood the material from a module, you could conceivably turn and work the homework for that module. Or you might wait until you go through all the modules that say we cover in a particular lecture and then go and do the homework consecutively for each one of those modules as you go through multiple choice questions, task-based simulation, et cetera, okay? But uh, you should definitely go through the material for a module before you start to work the questions for that module, okay? Remember, I went through the how to study file last time and it involved making the flashcards, memorizing the flashcards, and then attempting the homework questions, et cetera, that are part of your Becker material. Uh, you could do that module by module. You could maybe go through a few modules and then turn to your homework. I'll let you decide how to do that, but uh, you should definitely go through the material, memorizing the flashcards, et cetera, before you attempt any of the homework problems, all right? Okay, good. So I'm not gonna get into an introduction of the community sponsoring organizations of the Treadway Commission. They were a group that got away, got, got away. It sounds like they escaped from somewhere. They were a group that got together and they sat there and they started to put together a structure as to how we can evaluate an entity's internal control. Now we talk about in the auditing, as I mentioned, because, hey, auditors have to obtain an understanding, et cetera, of the internal control in an audit but it is also the responsibility of management to look at how to structure their internal control, evaluate their internal control in order to achieve the various objectives of the organization, okay? So that's what we say here. The framework is used, and now notice guys, we're focusing on company management, although auditors can use it too, and they are using this uh, and the board of management and of course the board of directors to obtain initial understanding of what constitutes an effective system of internal control, provide oversight as to when internal controls are being properly applied within the organization, okay? Now, they tell us that the framework, okay, the COSO framework can also be used by stakeholders um, that an organization has the system of internal control. And yeah, those stakeholders could start to become, for example, 
uh, otters. Okay, so when you think about it and what uh, the COSO framework does, it will help what? It'll help insiders, those are management and those charged with governance, but also what? Those outside the organization as well, in terms of assessing an entity's internal controls. Now, you take a look and an effective system of internal control and under this pass key, your pass key requires more than adherence to policies and procedures and internal auditors, it requires the use of what? Judgment, okay? We always come down to this notion that we have to use judgment in order to determine that the controls are adequate and it takes a principles-based approach. So we're going to see that we have basically five components to the internal control framework. And then we have 17 principles that fall under the various five components that constitute the entire uh, COSO framework, okay? So you come over and uh, you can see um, the application, and remember, it's not just management and those charged with governance, the board of directors, but it's also uh, external stakeholders as well. Internal management, those charged with governance, but also don't forget external stakeholders, as I've mentioned. So they've got this COSO cube, and I think you've seen this before, and you can see that you have the five components of the internal control. And then going across the top, you have the different objectives of the entity. Now, as accountants, we tend to have a fetish for what? For the financial reporting objectives, reliability financial reporting objective. But as we start to expand that beyond just the audit approach, the business, overall business approach, then we start to see that compliance with laws objective becomes more important to us compliance with our operations objectives, okay? So you can put these objectives across the top and then the components can help the entity to have adequate internal controls that will help achieve these objectives, okay? Now, what I like about the way they did the cube here versus my annoyance, as you remember with the way Becker presents the information in audit, they actually here, put it in the order that it is contemplated by the COSO, okay? So COSO contemplates that we have the control environment that sets the tone at the top. That's involving senior management, board of directors in this whole process. Then there's a risk assessment. Risk assessment, look at threats to achieving the objectives of the organization. Reliability finance reporting, compliance with laws. If it's a new law, let's say, the what the threat is hey we don't understand the full measure of what needs to be done to comply with this new law okay so these would be threats then what we do is we establish control activities those control activities help to mitigate the impact of those risks towards achieving the various objectives of the organization then we have information communication information is really focusing on our information systems and now it's not just accounting information system, it's also management information systems, how there can be controls established there to help uh, prevent the uh, 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 impact of these, putting these control uh, activities in place that will help mitigate the impact of the risk we've assessed and we can put certain information controls in there but it also involves communication because in some cases we need what? We need our employees to be the ones that are exercising their responsibility in the internal control to mitigate these risks and what happens. We need to communicate to them what their responsibilities are in that regard. And then we have monitoring. Most of the monitoring is going to be done through our internal audit function. And you say, well, what if we don't have an internal audit function? Well, if you don't have an internal audit function in an entity, you should, okay? So that internal audit function can obviously be performed by the internal audit uh, department, the internal auditors, and com many companies have that department, that group established, and it's their job to monitor these controls to see if they're having the desired outcome. Um, 
you could say, well, I know an entity that they don't have internal auditors. Well, then there should be members of the board of directors, probably members of the audit committee that are coming together to form that internal audit function. So just because a company says, well, we're too small to have a formal internal audit department doesn't get them off the hook for the monitoring part uh, of this process. Okay, now what happens if we're dealing with internal auditors here, who do internal auditors report to? That's a question. Or the director. Good, the internal auditors should report directly to the board of directors, right? Probably the audit committee, okay? And who's responsible for the control environment? highest levels of the organization, the board of directors. So if you look at this thing, even though we've sort of put it in this cube here, COSO did anyway to uh, to basically uh, present it in a matrix form, notice that what? This thing could also be seen as, and I'm just drawing the arrows randomly here, could be seen as a circle, right? We have the control environment, we make the risk assessment, we have the control activities, information communication, we put them into place, then we monitor, we find that, hey, some things maybe aren't having the desired outcome or they're not being um, effectively used, et cetera. Okay, question. Yes. Um, when you're outlining, are those the things we should be flashcarding? Um, when I want you to flashcard, I'll put FC. Okay. So the answer to your question is yes. So the, <laughs> because I put FC there. Okay. I was getting ready to go there. So yeah, you should have this flash guarded. Okay. Uh, and the best way to flash card an image like this is to just copy it and put it on a flash card. Okay. Because in a minute, we're going to look at the five components. And under those five components, they have 17 principles. And unfortunately, there are enough granular questions where they start to get into the principles that fall under these five components. And unfortunately, I'm going to ask, also have to ask you to flashcard the principles that fall under these components. Okay. Okay, good. Now, uh, take a look at the next page. And we just talk about the objectives and we had operating objectives, right? We want to be profitable. We want to be the number one qualified quality entity. We want to have the best product, whatever. Okay. Reporting objectives. Really, it's looking at reliability and financial reporting there. Okay. And again, uh, auditors do look at this very closely, but there's also compliance objectives. An entity has to operate in accordance with laws and regulations. And so we can establish internal controls around that. Okay. Okay, good. I don't think I have to ask you to flashcard this, even though I highlighted it, because we are uh, going to flashcard that whole cube. Okay. So we've got the components. And um, guys, this is annoying. What I don't like about this mnemonic, and they go nuts sometimes with mnemonics is it mixes what you have control environment risk assessment and then to spell crime they put information and instead what should go next is the e which is the uh existing control activities that get put in place but those get in put in place after the risk assessment then you have information communication and then you have monitoring so um you could maybe use this to help you randomly remember the components of the internal control, but I don't like that because that mnemonic does what? It destroys the, the flow to this thing, okay? It's not just bum, 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 you know, the components just throw them out there with no meaning as to how they all come together to help the entity to control the various objectives. So I'm not in love with that mnemonic, but somebody created that mnemonic some time ago, and I guess they just fell in love with it so much that now they feel they have to keep using it. 
and then they give you another picture of it over here and again they've got this out of order but what i do like about this picture is this right here okay so i do want you to realize that the control environment is the most pervasive uh, component of the control structure and yes the control environment does touch all of these other pieces but they have them kind of out of order here yeah risk assessment then the control activities well i guess we're going to make that number two, then theoretically that should be three, information communication should be four, and monitoring should be five. Okay, so just flashcard that cube. And then just remember, you know, it's not rocket science, that the control environment is the thing that is most pervasive that uh, touches all the other pieces. And again, they are in love with mnemonic crime because now they put it in a pass key and want you to spell in the little bubble, C-R-I-M-E, and all that nonsense. Meanwhile, the cube, the way the committee sponsoring organization, the Treadway Commission contemplated with the notion that it could also be a circle, it's a process. It's not just a bunch of things that you, you know, remember in any sort of random order, okay? All right, so again, control environment. Let's just focus on the control environment now, most pervasive, right? And so let's go ahead and focus on the control environment. And they start using phrases like tone at the top, okay? A commitment, and, and guys, there are five principles, okay? So uh, I'm gonna show you a flashcard here in a minute where it's gonna list the five components and then the 17 principles, but under the component control environment, we're gonna go through five uh, principles here, okay? Commitment to ethics, and integrity that comes from the top that comes from the board of directors okay board independence and oversight so the board is independent from management now you may have some members of the board of directors that are also management uh, but there needs to be some independence on that board of director organizational structure again we are looking for things like the board of directors establishing an internal audit function or performing them performing that themselves that says internal audit by the way guys if i write something and you don't know what i wrote just ask me but also realize that i tend to repeat the things as i'm writing them so when i write something i'll say the internal audit internal audit internal audit i'll do something like that because i know that my writing is nearly impossible to read so you're better off listening for the audio clue more than you are the visual clues i write things down but again what we want is a internal audit function that reports directly to the board of directors or the internal auditors uh, function is being performed directly by the board of directors but this would be a good example of an organizational structure issue Okay, commitment to competence. So what happens? Commitment to competence means that we are willing to hire, develop, retain uh, employees, but also what? It could involve consulting with those that are competent. So if you have a question about tax, and you're on the board of directors, what would you expect would be a competent response for a question say about tax or accounting? Who would we consult with about tax and accounting issues, do you think? CBA phone? Yeah, I mean, you know, let's put in a commercial for ourselves here, right? You would probably consult with a CPA or somebody, you know, that is well versed in accounting and tax, which often are CPAs. Okay, okay, good. Accountability is holding individuals accountable for their internal control responsibility. So I know we think of accountability, we think, oh, accounting. Well, consulting with CPAs, consulting with experts in accounting probably would come under more the commitment to competence. Accountability is sitting here and saying, hey, look, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, everyone understands their responsibility for the internal control. How would we do that? 
what component would would allow us to do that? That's the information communication. Okay, so even though the board of directors and control environment is sitting up here making individuals accountable, how do they know what they're accountable? When individuals, how do individuals know what they're accountable for? That comes through the information communication component. Okay. All right, good. Let's look at risk assessment. And risk assessment has four principles. So five under the control environment, four under risk assessment, that's nine. So if we've got 17, what do I got? Eight left to go in the remaining um, three components, right? Okay, that's the way that's working. So let's just take a look at uh, risk assessment. And basically we're looking for risks that will impede our ability to what? Uh, to achieve our objectives, okay? So we have to identify, we have to analyze the risk, and then we're gonna determine how to respond to those risks through our uh, control procedures, okay? Um, now, this is annoying to me that they next put information and communication because we know that what should come next are the control procedures. So because I'm a purist here, <laughs> I'm gonna go to what comes next just to make sure you understand that, that um, the uh, information communication is not the next thing. What comes next are the control activities themselves, okay? And so what do we do? when we're looking at the uh, control activities. And um, when we look at our control activities here that I'm jumping down for now, I've got myself a little bit uh, thrown off because I jumped the page. Okay, we have existing control activities and um, those are the activities that are gonna allow us to uh, mitigate the risks. There's really nothing there that's worth highlighting, to be honest with you, okay? Uh, but we put those control activities in place to mitigate the risks, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and you look now at information communication. In information communication, we have three principles, obtaining and using the information, internally communicating that information, and in some case, communicate with external parties. And so if we're seeing some issues with our internal control, then what? And we wanna communicate what the responsibilities are. We could, what, communicate that, and I'm writing in also to our auditors, okay? And then monitoring activities. And for our monitoring activities, we have two principles ongoing or separate evaluation. So ongoing would be more, um, you know, we're going to be looking at our control activities continuously as we go throughout the year to see that we're achieving the control objectives. A separate evaluation might be, uh, we want to look to see what the impact is of COVID compliance on our future operations or something like that. So you could call out a specific project or program that you want to be looked at as a, you know, do it every year. You do it one time uh, to respond to some particular question that uh, the board of directors may have at a point in time or management may have. And then of course, communicating deficiencies and those uh, internal audit is going to report those to parties responsible for taking corrective action. And uh, corrective action would probably go up to board of directors or the ones that would be informed of that. And then there'd be an expectation, et cetera, that management would take corrective actions, okay? And then for the existing control activities, which again is not the last part, monitoring is, then we would go ahead, select, develop the control activities, develop technology controls, develop policies and procedures. I think that's self-explanatory, okay? All right, now we went through a lot of detail there and I didn't ask you for a flashcard 
because I am asking for it under this pass key. Okay, so we have what? Five components, 17 principles, five under control environment. And you can flashcard them separately for each component. The principles under risk assessment, we talked about there are four of them, right? Principles under information communication, there are three of them. And then monitoring, there are two of them. And then finally, uh, the three that we talked about under control activities. But remember, make that flashcard that has the cube that I showed you to so remember the proper order because they're in love with their own mnemonic. And I think sometimes they, uh, in trying to keep that mnemonic in your head, they kind of destroy the thoughtful process of how this whole thing's supposed to come together. Okay. Okay, good. So we look at the internal control. We have this structure that COSO model gives us. And then we're going to go ahead and figure out well, what is the internal control effective. So we first say, is it present? In other words, does it address the relevant principles? Okay, is it designed? Then we look to see if it's functioning and is it functioning, meaning does it have operating effectiveness? So this should sound a little bit familiar to you from the auditing in that we talk about what in obtaining an understanding now the auditor we look at the design we look to see that the controls have been implemented right and then when we get to the functioning we look at the operating effectiveness so really um, these are things that management should be doing as well as auditors so auditors, so management should, and the board of directors should be looking at the design, seeing that those controls have been implemented. Um, then what, having the internal auditors maybe go and do some testing to see if there's operating effectiveness and then feeding that result. And again, it could be on an ongoing basis or it could be a standalone project that they're doing, feeding that back to management, the board of directors, okay? All right, good. Now come down and let's just take a look at effective internal control under COSO, okay? And internal control deficiencies are shortcomings in a component's components and relevant principles reduce the likelihood that the entity will achieve its objectives. Now, as you know, in auditing, we use the term significant deficiency and material weakness in the COSO, um, vernacular, if you will, they call that a, a major deficiency. Okay, so if they talk about a major deficiency in the control, that means that there's some problem with the control that is not going to allow the entity to achieve its objectives. What are its objectives? Compliance, operational, reliability and financial reporting, okay? And then there's there is a major deficiency. That means that there's some problem, some shortcoming that would not allow the entity to achieve its objectives. Okay. Now they take a look and they remind us of limitations of internal control here. Okay. And uh, what I want you to write over here, I'm going to ask you to flashcard these. Okay. But a good way to think about this is that humans, human, human involvement human involvement generally equals what equals limitation. Okay, and the reason I say that is when you start to look at these limitations that I want you to flashcard human failure. Bias judgment. Computers don't make judgments. Computers aren't biased, right? Computers just take facts and respond, right? Um, issues relating to the sustainability of entities' objectives. Well, computers don't, you know, leave and go work for another company, right? Or, you know, die or retire or have a nervous breakdown, break up with their girlfriend and can't think straight anymore. You know, this is a human thing, right? Uh, external events beyond the control of the entity, that could be a human factor, but it could also not be a human factor. You know, you have some sort of 
uh, disaster that takes out certain controls, certain systems, what are you going to do, right? That's beyond the entity's uh, uh, control. Circumvention of control through collusion. There's come, here come the humans again. Management override of internal controls. It's the humans again, right? So, you know, uh, external events beyond the entity's control don't necessarily have to be caused by humans, but they could. And so um, you take a look and uh, I think this is a good way of, <clears throat> well, flashcarding it is an excellent way, but if you get stuck with something just in where they're asking about limitation, just think about human involvement and that's probably the right answer. Okay, question. All right, so the way we do things guys is I put up a poll and the poll then, and please don't tell me I'm gonna have to on the fly create the poll here because I always forget to do that for the first class, then it's there after that, but let's see, please let it be there. Okay, but when I do the poll, um, you re I give you about two minutes to respond to the poll. So you have a chance to look at this and see if what you have taken from the material. If you're not sure of an answer after about two minutes, I ask you to go ahead and take your best choice. Why am I asking you to do that? That's what we're preparing to do. We're hoping that we'll look at the question in about a minute, ah, got it, and get the right answer. But if after you get to a minute and a half, two minutes on a question, you're still, oh, I don't know, maybe it's A or B, pick one and move on. Remember we talked about timing in our first class and it is vital that you move through these questions. Don't sit here waiting for God to come down and tell you, yeah, it's B. that's not gonna happen, okay? Sometimes you're gonna have to go with your gut and your best choice and not um, necessarily think that you're gonna always feel completely confident with every answer, okay? So let's just go ahead and let's launch the poll. Okay, so you should be able to see that on the screen. And what you wanna do is read through the question and you wanna consider every choice. I don't care if you would be willing to give your firstborn that A is the choice. You still need to read B, C, and D before you finalize your decision, okay? All right, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to go through that. Okay, I'm gonna admonish somebody that after 44 seconds picked A, and I'm not even sure why, other than maybe you saw the word auditors there, but you clearly did not read through all four choices when you picked A. Okay, stop, stop. Okay, I'm gonna do the old, um, music teacher thing when the band is playing the song incorrectly i'm not going to allow you to continue to play that song mainly because i don't want to hear a song that i like being destroyed by a band that ain't playing it right okay so i'll just put up that most of us got it right but let me give you a little coaching first on how to approach a question okay you're sitting here you've got two minutes okay and you want to see what you think the best choice is so let me just go ahead and uh, stop sharing results so we can see the question. Okay, so you're sitting here on the screen. It should be in your book there in front of you, but uh, let's go ahead. The external auditors for Horace Company assess the achievement internal control objective each year and communicate the assessment to management and the board. Communication by the external auditors illustrates which principle of the information communication component of the committee sponsoring organizations of the uh, Treadway Commission. Now, we sit here and you look at what? You look at the fact that we're talking about principles, okay? And we said that there were, I forget, three principles under information communication, which you would have had a flashcard, okay? And then you start to look at this and they're talking about what? External auditors. They're talking about the external auditors, okay? So 
why would you ever think that the internal control information, the internal communication would be the right answer? I mean, they're telling you external. And then you start to take a look and you're like, well, financial reporting information, does that even contemplate a communication aspect? I don't think so. So that's where you start getting to what? External communication about the internal control. Okay. So you read through the question, understand the question, but then you start getting into what? Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember. But if you had the flashcard, you should remember the three components. But if you could communication, but if you couldn't remember, then you would probably look, well, they're telling us about external auditors. That's an external communication. Question? Okay, good. All right. I'm just, I wanted to go through that one with you to see if that helps you now with the next one. And this time I promise I'll give you the full two minutes. Okay. Use it to consider each of the choices, consider each of the choices and then make your best choice. Professor, can, uh, can you move the screen up a little bit? I can't see the remaining choices. Let's see if you cannot do anything to your screen. Oh, I mean, um, the P, I can't see the P on my screen. But it's okay. You can't see what? I can't see the P on my screen. A, B, C, I can't see B. Okay, are you able to scroll down through the screen or something? No, it's fine. Um, I'll just get download the PDF. I think you need to go to view options here. I mean, I can, I, I'm happy to move it up, but I can see it on my screen. Oh, okay. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I can move it on your screen. You can move the poll up on your screen. No, I mean the, the, the PDF. But it's fine. I'll just um, I downloaded it on my iPad. Okay, I can move it up. I can see it on my screen though. I see what you're asking. Yeah, I can move it up. Sorry, it took me a minute. I was thinking you were asking me the quiz itself which that I can't move, but I can move the PDF, yes. Okay, good. Looks like most of us have done this now. Uh, make your choice here because I always have that one person that doesn't want to answer the poll for some reason. Okay, but good. This is the kind of result we're looking for here, guys. Okay, we've got what? We've got 73%, although my last person came in and chose A. Okay, um, but um, before I put this um, up, we were at a little higher than that. Okay, so we want to be in class at about 75%. You wanna be getting the choices right about 75% of the time. Why? If you get them right 75% of the time here in class, that's already a 75 on the material. And then as you go through, and by the way, you see these same homework questions again uh, when you go through your homework set, 
Okay, so when you're going through module one, same questions, not only these questions, there'll be others obviously, but these same questions will come up again. So you see this, you learn from these questions, you see analogous questions. When you go through your homework, maybe your percentages come up to 80%, maybe 90%. Then you put those questions away. And then when you're doing your prep, final prep for your exam, now your percentages are in that 85, 90% range. And by the time you get to the exam, you should be working multiple choice questions at 90%. If you're getting what? If you're getting 90% from multiple choice questions, multiple choice questions contemplate 50 points on the exam, 50 points times 0.9 is 45 points to uh, pass the exam. You need what? You need a 75, 75 minus 45 equals what? Equals 30, 30 divided by 50 is what? 60%? 60 or 80? That's a question. I don't know why everybody likes to watch me do my, is this interesting? Okay, no, it's not. So if I ask you, just tell me. Okay, so it's what, 60%? Yes. Okay, all right, 60%. Okay, that means that you could be doing what? The other 50 points, these are your sims down here, right? You could be working your sims at D level work and still pass the exam by making sure that you're comfortable with the multiple choice questions, okay? But that means that you've got to go through this process, read the question, understand the question, take your best shot, try to keep yourself close to 70%, even if you get the questions wrong half the time. So what, when we're together here in class, that's still a 50. Now you only need to do what? Now you only need to get yourself up a little higher to when you go through these questions when you're doing your homework, but the process starts here it starts here exercising your brain going through these uh this material okay but the answer here is d okay so i'm gonna stop sharing the results to get that out of the way so let's just go ahead and take a look and they say a company that retains a cpa with appropriate knowledge skills and abilities now you start seeing that that is talking to what how competent somebody is the more knowledgeable the more skillful they are the more abilities they have the more competent they are, um, apl is applying the idea for rich principle uh, of effective internal control over financial reporting. Now this gets a little bit funky and that they start to talk about an objective, but the things that they list here are what? Are control environment and activities and or principles, I should say. And what we're talking about is what, what would happen in the control environment to, to uh, employ those that have the appropriate knowledge, skills, and abilities, then we're looking at what? We're looking at competencies, okay? Now, what makes this question a little bit hard is all of these things that they listed were what? Were under the control environment component and so you really needed to look to these words here to understand that we were talking about competencies. Okay. Question. Okay, good. All right. So let's go ahead and continue on now and talk about how to apply or use the COSO framework. Okay. And what you can do the way you'll use this is you will sit here and come up with an overall assessment of the internal control, do a component evaluation. So the five components are working together. And so you want to look at all five components, look at the principles. Okay. Now each of the principles should be identifiable under the components or you should be able to determine why a principle is not relevant to the component. So expectation is all the components are there. Expectation is that the principles are largely there. And in the event that a principle is not relevant, then there better be a good explanation as to why a particular principle is not relevant to component. And then you will go ahead and see if there are any deficiencies. If there are deficiencies, then that will feed back into what? into that overall assessment 
and this process continues. So again, you could almost look at this as circular, okay? So let's go ahead and look at the components, okay? And let's see what they tell us about the components and notice that um, a management identifies risk that could individually or in combination result in mater material uh, omissions or misstatement in the financial statements. And again, this whole system works together. So even though you look at it from component, you understand that the components are interconnected, right? That's why I don't like the way they keep using that crime mnemonic because it sort of takes away the evaluation that's going on within the uh, structure, the, con the COSO structure. Okay, so risk varied by entities. So if you are in multiple geographic areas, multiple regulatory environments, transactional environments with numerous contracts, uh, you're involved in certain activities like acquisitions, okay, dynamic technology, high executive turnover environment, all of these could be things that would be um, considered risk uh, for various entities. And of course, fraud is a major consideration. Okay? Look at this. So we start to take a look and risk of fraud is typically characterized by either being fraudulent financial reporting or misappropriation of assets. And of course, fraud means what? It is intentional. Let's go ahead and flashcard some specific risks related to fraud, right? That's fraud is something that you know, keeps us up at night. So let's just flashcard that. Management bias in exercising judgment, degree of estimates and judgments underlying the accounting and reporting, incentive for fraud, bonuses based on a better financial performance could result in financial reporting fraud. Okay. Continuing that flashcard on to the next page here. Okay. Uh, attitudes and rationalizations by individuals, unusual transactions, uh, vulnerability to management override. Okay, so flashcard these components that could be relevant to fraud, but let's go ahead and focus on management override here. And management override, override refers to actions taken by management and attempt to override the controls for per personal uh, gain, right? So we need to be uh, considering that. And you say, well, why would management put these controls in place and then override them and basically to sort of make it look like they have the what commitment to ethical integrity. Meanwhile, they know that they have certain powers to override the controls. Um, and that has often been the case when, you know, we've had these, uh, fraud schemes and shenanigans, most of the time, you know, there's probably somebody in the um, company that's ringing the bell saying, hey, this is not right. And they're being overridden by higher level individuals um, like uh, management. And that was really the big part of the story with Enron, right? Which was one of the major fraud schemes. Okay, so management override is a concern. We also, of course, want to what be in compliance with laws. And so for illegal acts, if there's investigations going on, reports of regulatory uh, examinations, delinquent tax returns, all of these would be indication, obviously, that there's been some illegal acts. But flashcard, illegal acts, fraud, um, these are the areas that are of major concern. And so we'd want to make sure that we're uh, flashcarding indicators of those problems. Okay, now management considers how risk or omissions and misstatements could be managed across the entity. And then management, again, we're looking at this from the standpoint of management, even though from the auditing discussion, you're probably having some deja vu, but deja vu. But management selects, deploys controls to effectively apply principles within each component to respond. Um, and um, management considers various factors here. And I'm not going to go through all these because it's pretty obvious some of these, the laws, rules, regulations, whatever it is that applies to the achievement of the jet objective. Okay. Now let's take a look at now the selection and deployment. 
okay, of controls. And let's just take a look at how we will then respond to these concerns that we've been looking at in the last uh, couple sections here. So use workshops to map risk, implement effective controls, consider the type of control activity, okay? Consider alternative controls to segregation of duties and uh, identify incompatible functions, okay? So again, we're looking at these, these uh, risks, fraud, et cetera, and then we're responding to them by selection and development of various controls, okay? Okay. Question. When yeah. they say incompatible functions, what do they mean by that? Is that getting at segregation of duties? Yes, uh, so we are supposed to segregate, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. I think it's in the enterprise risk management discussion that they finally raised these up. But yeah, we're talking about the authorization, custody, and record keeping. And I'm going to put record keeping in there. I'm going to squeeze it up in there. And I'll show you why if you want to squeeze. You know, why are you squeezing that in there? Because you can remember that by remembering ARC, authorization, record keeping, and custody. Now I destroyed my little picture here by screwing on my circle. ARC, that we're spelling that, we're pronouncing that ARC. So you want to separate the authorization from a transaction to the record keeping to the custody. Now, this pertains a little more to auditing, but is still in the ballpark for what we're talking about here, because management should also be considering the same thing. So when you're looking to see if something's an authorization function, think of an authorization department. Well, an authorization, think of departments here when you think about this. So authorization department. So if I need some supplies for the company, my purchasing department should be the entity that's authorizing the transaction. When I talk about custody, then what? I should have a separate department, my receiving department that actually receives those things that have been ordered. And then the record keeping for the payable and whatnot should be going through a separate department, the accounts payable, uh, the accounting department. So you wanna separate those two, uh, those three, excuse me, and if you have any two of those combined, then that would be an incompatible function. Now, in a automated environment, you can combine these because, you know, computers don't order stereos for themselves and take them home. Okay, whereas what a human might do that, right? So we, you could combine some of these in an automated environment, but there should be some separation. Okay. Okay, we'll get more into that here in a minute, but that's what they mean by incompatible duty. Okay, good. So let's come over and uh, let's take a look down here a little bit more and selection development of general controls over um, technology, okay? So general controls are uh, basically things that are gonna be over the entire system, okay? so. Uh, configure IT infrastructure to re support restricted access and segregation of duties. Okay, so let's just talk about that. So do you want employees to be able to use their general, um, you know, network password? Do you want them to also be able to use that to log in to say the payroll records? No, the human resources records, no. Okay, so that's what we mean by using password as a general control to restrict access and maintain segregation of duties. Now, um, how, oh, well, forgive me guys, I get into auditing mode every now and then, but let's say you're, you're management and you're trying to evaluate whether there's appropriate general controls related to segregation of duties in the computer system, let's say your internal auditor, you would look and you would go to your IT lead, your IT manager, whatever, and say, I would like to see a listing of the functions that various individuals have in the system. And you would want to understand that what somebody who has the ability to release a payment through an electronic funds transfer 
doesn't also have the ability to log into the accounting records to update accounting records because what you've done now is you've combined authorization to release a payment with record keeping. So even in an IT environment, you can still look to see that individuals don't have in, uh, compat incompatible duties within the system through restricting access, et cetera. Okay, these are considered um, IT, uh, excuse me, general controls in an IT system, uh, administrative security access, okay, et cetera. Now, you come through, come down, I should say, and um, you can see that we have uh, developing controls through policies and procedures. So, of course, we're going to develop policies and procedures, deploy control activities through the business unit, and conduct the regular ad hoc assessment of control activities. Okay. All right. So, key thing, guys, is the few flashcards that I asked for, but absolutely, you got to have those flashcards that list the five components and the principles there within. The rest of this, I think, starts to become pretty familiar as you go through um, questions and work with those. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I generally take the break at 6.20. We're 10 minutes ahead of that, though, but I'm going to go ahead since we're done with our first module. It seems like a more logical break point here and we will come back after the 10 minute break and we'll pick up module two okay so i'm showing about 6 12 so i hate to be on a weird time but let's go ahead and say 6 22 okay which is kind of an odd time but that'll give us well i'm showing 6 10 so we can come back at 6 20. 6.20. We take a 10-minute break, usually at 6.20 or so, but we'll do it tonight at 6.10, and we'll come back at 6.20. We'll pick up the discussion of enterprise risk management, which again is something that comes from COSO, but now it gets to how to manage risk as opposed to just the overall term control related to entity objectives. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Somebody remind me when I come back to resume the recording. And uh, let's go ahead and start to talk about enterprise risk management. Okay, now again, uh, it's the um, same entity, COSO, but uh, now they came up with this way to assist in developing comprehensive response to uh, risk management. Now, as I said a little earlier when we were talking about the uh, outline, um, I think that one of the first things we want to get in our mind is what risk management is, because I think that a lot of times we think, well, risk management is sitting there and doing everything to avoid something that's risky. Well, that could be a way of managing risk, but that's only a small piece of how an entity will manage risk because some things you can't avoid. I mean, if you're gonna be in business, you're going to encounter certain risk. So the analogy that I like to use that everyone can relate to is there's a risk that if you drive a car, you're going to have an accident and there's going to be some sort of financial or uh, health impact, health or wealth impact to that. So you say to yourself, well, I know how to manage that risk. I'm never gonna drive. Well, that's not practical. That's not practical. You can't sit there and decide not to drive. I mean, maybe some of you don't, but you know, I think that uh, often people realize eventually you're going to have to have some wheels to get you from point A to point B. So what do you do? Well, you start to manage those risks and you start to manage those risks against the objective of staying healthy. Well, how do you manage the risk of staying, of wanting to stay healthy? You keep your car in good working order. You buckle your seatbelt. Now, when you buckle the seatbelt, that's essentially saying what? That's saying that the bad thing is going to happen. I'm going to have the accident, but I've got this thing to mitigate the potential of uh, injury, right? 
a wealth aspect, financial aspect, you share the risk with an insurance company, of course, um, as is the case in many risk scenarios, there are um, laws and regulations that uh, enforce risk management on an entity, you have to have insurance anyway, but the idea of insurance is sharing the risk of financial loss from an accident with the insurance company. Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Okay, so you take a look and what we need to do, and again, this is management that's doing this. So management decisions will affect the development of value, including creation, preservation, erosion, and realization. Okay, so we have to consider the value to this. Now, value can be defined differently by different entities. And notice that we have broken out here the consideration for a for-profit commercial entity versus a uh, not-for-profit entity. Okay, and so they tell us for a for-profit value may be shipped may be shaped by strategies that balance market opportunities against the risk of pursuing those opportunities. So example there might be what? Uh, the economic opportunity, if you're an oil company, let's say of drilling for oil versus what? Versus the risk of having some sort of oil spill or something that will adversely impact the environment, adversely impact um, the reputation of the entity, and there could be financial implications to that, but uh, you have to weigh those values, right? For for-profit, notice it is shaped by the delivery of goods and services uh, that balance the opportunity to serve the broader community against any associated risk. Uh, guys, we've lived through this, right? Uh, I'm a not-for-profit entity. I want to be providing services to individuals that are at some sort of risk, but because the fear that I might transmit disease, I have to cut or curtail uh, some of those services, right? So not-for-profit and government entities have to consider those. Although in the case of a government entity, they may have, they have no choice. I mean, their whole job is to respond to the bad thing that happens. And so they may not be able to uh, use that sort of a value-driven proposition of deciding. They just have to go in when a bad thing happens, right? Okay, so go ahead and flashcard that sort of consideration of value in a for-profit versus not-for-profit or government uh, setting. Okay, now you come over and we look at value creation. Value creation is created when benefits of value exceed the cost of resources. Okay, and you can see that there are a variety of resources, human capital, actual capital, right? Financial capital, technology, et cetera. All of these are costs and the benefits should outweigh the costs in the creation of value. Okay, all right, good. Now you come over and you take a look at value preservation and values preserved when ongoing operations effectively and effectively, effectively and efficiently and effectively sustain created benefits. So high customer satisfaction with a profitable product line, for example, okay? And then value erosion is what is realized, whoops, value erosion right here. Value is eroded when faulty strategy and effective operations cause value to decline. Value realization is when benefits created by the organization are received by stakeholders, either in monetary or non-monetary form. Obvious monetary form would be we increase the value of the company stock, et cetera, as a result of our value realization. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and we start to give some definitions to things that I think you know pretty well. Notice I'm going through a lot of this pretty quickly because they're sort of self-explanatory, but I want to highlight a few things. And mission re represents the core purpose of the entity. Uh, vision represents the aspirations and hopes over time, okay? Core values represent the organization's belief and ideals about what is good or bad, acceptable 
unacceptable influence uh, the behavior of the organization. So just going back to the drilling for oil scenario, right? You may say, well, uh, we're comfortable drilling for new oil, and I don't know anything about the oil and gas industry, but you know, oil prospects in areas of the environment that have already been impacted by this, but our values are that we don't want to uh, expand that kind of activity to areas that have previously not seen this sort of exploration. So we're not gonna open up any new areas of the environment for drilling for oil, for oil exploration, exploration, something like that. Now you're having that core value and that core value could stand in contrast to certain missions, certain visions. And so all of these sort of work together in determining what sort of risk the entity is going to engage and then how are they going to ultimately uh, manage those risks and really the managing comes through the avoiding Avoiding would be, I'm just not gonna drill for oil because it's against my core values. Accepting the risk, mitigating the risk through sharing it, et cetera. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, okay? But just trying to tie it together how this would ultimately get to the um, risk management steps that we're gonna be looking at here in a couple of minutes. Uh, culture, okay? And this represents the collective thinking of people in the organization. Now, culture, is sort of an interesting one in that that's really saying to us, hey, it's not all about just the uh, individuals that sit at the top of the organization. So culture can come from the bottom up of an organization, right? Okay, now there should be senior management and board of director involvement, but it also means that we can influence the values of the companies and their core values through culture, okay? All right, good. Now we look for um, capabilities. So we're looking for competitive advantage that produces value for the entity. Okay. Then we have practices. Okay. Enterprise risk management is an organizational practice that applies the entire scope of activities of a business. Okay. And then we're going to integrate our strategy with setting and a strategy setting and performance. So strategy is a set in a manner that aligns with the mission and visit vision. And notice here that business objectives flow from the static strategy. Business objectives drive the activities of all business units and functions. Okay, and I'm not asking for a lot of flashcards for you guys because many of this stuff is sort of, you know, definitional and uh, kind of, you know, common sense. So when we start to manage risks related to value, we have to consider the risk appetite of the entity. And the risk appetite represents the types and amount of risk on a broad level that the organization is willing to accept in the pursuit of value, okay? So we're looking at our culture, at our core values, and that is feeding in to our risk appetite, okay? And risk appetite is expressed first in mission and vision. Risk appetite varies between products, business units, and will change over time, right? And uh, again, I think my personal opinion is that we've been through unprecedented times where we uh, probably have had changes in our perception of values and risk because of the uh, pandemic, okay? Okay, good. Now, let's take a look at relationship of value and risk appetite. Let's go ahead and flashcard that. ERM seeks to align, anticipate value cre creation with risk appetite and capabilities for managing risk over time, okay? So again, we're looking at the values of the company. We're looking at how different risks are going to affect our ability to achieve the value, achieve in the, in the constraint of our core values and the constraint of our uh, culture, et cetera. And then we're going to look for risks that are going to affect that. And then we're gonna manage those risks accordingly, okay? So let's go ahead and continue now with these enterprise risks 
management is in terms of the idea of value you know, we're countering all this and then we're going to start to take some steps for example we will look and take a risk inventory okay what are the risks that are going to affect us what are some of the threats to the organization then we're going to go ahead and establish a reasonable expectation and we're going to recognize that no one can predict risk with precision that's the whole problem with it you don't know when or if it's going to happen and so you have to say well i will assume that the bad thing will happen and i'm going to respond accordingly to that assumption or if you think it's highly unlikely that the bad thing will happen maybe you just accept that risk and hope that you stay and you fall in that uh, small percentage of the bad thing actually happening okay now when you look at risk capacity is the maximum amount of risk that an entity is able to absorb in the pursuit of a strategy and business objectives. So, you know, that's really um, something that you consider in any decision. Um, if I quit my job and I pursue another opportunity, let's just put it in that context, okay, of an individual, if I accept this, quit my job and I accept this other offer that I have, the benefit is that I'm going to get more pay, let's say. Uh, the risk is that I will be successful in that and I'll lose what I have now. Can I stand the impact of losing what I have now? You know, what are the chances that I'll catch on with somebody else and be in the same really kind of environment? And if you say to yourself, I can't live with the potential outcome of leaving this job that I have now, and many, many people make that decision every day, I'm just going to stay here because I can't stand the impact of losing this opportunity because what it's going to do to my family or whatever, right? Okay. So after the entity considers that, then they can come up with a risk profile. The risk profile is a composite view of risk assumed at a particular level of the entity or aspect of the business that positions management to consider the type, severity, and independence of risk and how they may affect the performance relative strategy and business objectives. So you've got an inventory of risk. You consider what is our risk capacity. That allows you to then to consider the severity of the risk and how they may affect the ability to perform okay then you come down and uh, over to the next page and you really will be doing things at a department divisional level okay but you really will also take a portfolio view so a comprehensive view of the risk the entity faces which positions management the board of directors to consider the types and severity of independent interdependence of risk you can also take an organizational strategy, the ability of an entity to withstand the impact of large scale events. And then performance management is the measurement of efforts to achieve exceed, exceed strategies and business objectives. So when you look at the interrelationship, okay, enterprise risk management is depicted as having a series of sequential yet intertwined components that drive the organization towards enhanced value. So you take a look and we're doing this in terms of achieving this enhanced value, but that then gets intertwined with governance and culture, strategy, objective setting, performance, review and revision, information, communication and reporting. So if you look at this, you have five components that are sort of in line with what we saw in the internal control model, right? You had what? You had control environment and that involved the corporate governance structure. You had risk uh, assessment, right? So that could be seen as strategy objective. And you had the control activities. So they're doing it in a similar manner, but now it's not just all about the internal control and the narrow perspective of those, um, uh, objectives of the internal control. Now they're laying it across what the goal of having enhanced uh, value, which should flow from our from our mission, 
from our core values, from our culture, et cetera. Okay. Question. Yeah, uh, go ahead and flashcard this though. I want you to flashcard this picture. You can just kind of copy that. I just want to get that. But go ahead. Um, I don't understand the portfolio view thing. Um, portfolio view is basically saying that uh, we, even though you're going to be looking at opportunities in a functional aspect of the company, you need to bubble that up into the overall view of the entity. So it's, it, it's unrealistic to think that if I do this in department A, that it couldn't also have an impact on department B, right? So when you do a portfolio view, you need to sort of consider how one area of strategy in one part of the entity across a functional sort of matrix approach could affect another part of the business. Question? So really it's the interdependency of risk and how they may affect the entity's performance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, again, flashcard the components and how it kind of leads to the components lead to this enhanced value. And then let's just go ahead now. And just like we did for the uh, COSO model, and I guess you kind of flashcarded it up there, but I want to make sure that you see them here and that you have flashcarded the uh, components of the uh, enterprise risk management. Okay, so go ahead and take a look at that and then note as we did with COSO, uh, the internal control part of COSO, this is also COSO, um, we have what? We have the five components and then we have uh, 20, we had 17 principles with the um, internal control. Here we have 20. So we're gonna take a similar approach where we're gonna go through and look at the principles that constitute the, um, the, the, that constitute the components. And I do want you to flashcard this table right here. Okay, so what are the principles that fall into the five components the way they've done? They give you this mnemonic, guys, I'm, you know, this is nonsense. First of all, they want you to remember doves soar. Um, no, they don't. Have you ever seen a dove soar? I mean, doves kind of fly along clumsily from what I can see. So I've never really seen a dove soaring, okay? Um, so not only is it not correct technically, at some point, the task of trying to line up this mnemonic with what it's trying to get you to remember is more difficult. I believe it's infinitely more difficult than just simply taking the flashcard and remembering the principles that constitute the um, uh, components and that's it. Okay, you don't need to start putting yourself into these funny little mnemonic boxes, which I think they've come up with these sometimes just to humor themselves. Okay, so don't worry about the mnemonic. Do make that flashcard. Okay, now let's just go ahead though and spend a little time looking at some of these. So governance and culture. And again, they tell us that's doves. Okay, and it involves what? It involves board oversight. Okay, that's when we're talking about governance. We're talking about the board of directors being involved in that. Okay. Okay, good. Then we come over to establishing operating structure. Okay. When we establish operating structure, operating structure describes how an entity organizes and carries out. And we look at what day to day operations, right? So this is a very detailed piece of understanding how we're going to um, manage our risk. Okay defines desired culture. The organization defines the desired behaviors and characteristics that are consistent with the entity's culture. Remember, we're tying this all in with our entire mission and our culture and our values in terms of trying to create enhanced value, okay? 
Uh, we have to demonstrate commitment to those core values. Okay? And again, these do come down from the top, but culture also allows them to uh, bubble up through the entity. Okay. Okay, good. Coming over. Then we will attract, develop, and retain capable individuals. And that really obviously involves what the human resource factor, trying to make sure that we are identifying talent that have the knowledge, skills, expertise, but it also involves identifying those individuals who maybe have a shared culture uh, with the organization, right? Okay. Okay, good. Then we move to the next component, strategy and objective setting. And again, sorry, I highlighted the mnemonic because I don't want you to use the mnemonic here because I think it's too cumbersome, but setting strategy and business objectives that consider both internal and external factors. Um, so the organization sets its risk appetite in conjunction with strategy setting. And again, the business objective allows strategy to be put into practice and shape the entities. Again, we're looking at our day-to-day -day operations. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this risk appetite. Okay, and the company defines the risk appetite. And notice the organization defines risk appetite in the context of creating, preserving, and realizing value. Now, entities consider risk appetite in quantitative terms, while others may be qualitative. So, hey, I'm willing to take this much loss from an accident. Uh, I'm willing to take this much loss from an accident, uh, not dollar amount, but what it does to the reputation of the company, okay? So you can have a low risk appetite, high risk appetite are ways of uh, expressing your risk appetite and referencing targets, ranges, ceilings, or floors may also be useful. Now, um, under the Obama administration, uh, what Obama required just to not have this be this purely theoretical, although it is a highly theoretical discussion, but um, you may look at all this and say, well, does any entity do this stuff? And um, Obama required that federal agencies have to go through and do an enterprise risk management approach to how they're setting up their mission, their goals, their uh, enhanced value, et cetera. And so, um, since we're kind of dealing off the heels of the pandemic, I thought it was interesting to see, well, okay, can we see where enterprise risk management is used in the federal government? And um, the Center for Disease Control was the one I thought to look at, because I'm like, well, how would they be talking about their enterprise risk management? And they start talking about their risk philosophy and the risk appetite, right? Right here out of what we were looking at. And uh, let's just look at risk appetite, okay? CDC works 24 seven to protect Americans from health, safety and security threats, both foreign and in the US. CDC recognizes that it is neither desirable nor practical to avoid all risk in pursuit of this mission. It is necessary for CDC to accept some risk in alignment with its risk appetite and they start to talk about um, what their risk appetite is, et cetera. But again, it's driving the way the entity um, establishes and gets to its enhanced value. So if this is a goal of the CDC, is it reasonable that the CDC would not be involved in looking at what emerging risk of things that's maybe affecting another part of the world? Absolutely not. Now they're going to take on some risk there. They're taking on the risk that they may expose their own employees to being subject to a place where there's some sort of outbreak of disease. But if they're looking at saying, well, we have to accept that kind of a risk because we can maybe mitigate something earlier before it becomes the unfortunate, you know, global pandemic that we just all experienced. Um, so um, these are the kinds of discussions that you'd see. Uh, and you could see this probably on an entity may, may provide this. 
it is required that federal agencies do this. Obama said, you're going to have to go through and make this assessment and publish that on your website. Um, and that, those, that information is there for all federal agencies. Okay. Um, and I guess under Biden, they'll get back to updating this kind of stuff. For some reason under Trump for a long time, stuff just got frozen. They didn't change these things. They're supposed to do these things every year and make them available every year. And for some reason, under Trump, they just ignored things that were written into law. They just didn't do them uh, for some reason. But uh, I think now they should be updating those, et cetera. OK, so let's just go back, though. And that's, again, just to give you um, an example of how this stuff might be practically applied. OK, all right, good. Now we come over. And let's just go over to the next page and look at how these consideration of risk appetite, et cetera, would allow us to formulate our business objectives. So business objectives are developed that are specific, measurable, or observable, obtainable, and relevant. The organization sets targets to monitor the performance of the entity and support the achievement of its business objectives and monitoring performance includes concepts of tolerance. Tolerance is the range of acceptable outcomes relating to achieving business objective within the risk appetite. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's flashcard that. Okay, so we set up a risk appetite and we have tolerance is the range of acceptable outcomes related to that, but notice that's within the risk appetite and tolerance is also referred to uh, as the acceptable variance in performance, okay? So when we get to performance now, risk is prioritized according to the severity and the risk appetite. The organization then selects risk responses and monitors performance for any changes in that. So we identify the risks, and then coming over to the next page, okay, we assess the severity of the risk. And the severity of the risk, let's just look at this and let's flashcard some of this, is evaluated after it has been identified, of course. Resources and capabilities are deployed to keep the risk within the entity's risk appetite. Okay, so we can assess the severity of the risk. Let's just flashcard these factors in assessing the severity of risk. The severity of risk is assessed at multiple levels. So cross division, operating units, that's taking more, that more holistic, what they call portfolio type approach. Okay, severity measures relate to impact. Okay, and we can look at impact as um, the result of the effect of the risk, but we also look at the likelihood, the possibility of the risk occurring. And we can look at it quantitative and qualitatively. So you kind of put this all together in that, hey, maybe you have a risk that the impact is not very severe and the likelihood is not very low, then maybe you can accept that risk. If you have something with what? High impact and a high likelihood, well, you're absolutely going to have to manage that risk by not accepting it, but maybe avoiding that activity. Then you get to some things that are maybe high impact, but medium severity. Maybe you share that risk through insurance, et cetera. Okay. So you do that assessment and then you make the following uh, decisions. Okay. And let's just go ahead and take a look. Uh, well, actually, uh, risk assessment also includes, I do want to look at this, inherent risk is the risk that the entity in the absence of any direct or focused actions management is uh, management to alter its severity. Target risk is the amount of risk the entity uh, prefers to assume in the pursuit of strategy, knowing that management will implement um, direct or focused actions to alter the severity of the risk. So again, taking out insurance, for example, okay? And then actual residual risk is the risk remaining after management has taken uh, action. So there's always some amount 
of residual risk that's going to be there in spite of management action. And so we'd want to uh, consider that, okay? Now, um, we will then prioritize the risk, again, those with higher impact and higher probability, we're probably going to avoid that activity. Those with lower um, probability and lower impact, maybe we just accept those risks, okay? So we go ahead and we implement our risk response, and let's go ahead and flashcard what we're going to do here. Acceptance means no action. We just accept the risk. Avoid action, okay, is taken to remove the risk. So we're just not going to drill for oil anymore. Pursue action is taken that accepts increased risk to achieve improved performance. Pursuit, pursuit of risk is appropriate when management understands the nature and extent of any changes required to perform the desire, uh, achieve the desired performance. You know, some entities um, specialize in the pursuit of risk, okay? Uh, entities that loan money to uh, companies that have credit issues or problems, they're actually pursuing risk, right? Okay, but of course, they're gonna have to work around that. Uh, reduce is action taken to reduce the severity of the risk. So you don't get completely out, you don't avoid it, but you reduce the risk, share the risk, and the classic example of sharing the risk there, as I've mentioned a couple of times, is insurance, okay? All right, good. So you look at these, and um, if you accept the risk, what happens? Um, you're looking at, well, the risk of driving a car, right? You accept that risk, I think we all do. And if you take no action taken, then you're gonna probably go ahead and what? Probably go ahead and just not wear a seatbelt, right? Uh, avoid the action, you know, don't drive, right? Pursue the action, hey, you know, I my perceived outcome is that I want to get somewhere faster. So I'm going to take the freeway because I can get there faster. So I'm pursuing the risk of driving faster on the freeway versus reducing the risk. I'm going to take the slower back lanes. I won't get there as fast, but at least if I do have an accident, it's going to be at a low speed and that's going to reduce the severity of the risk. Share, uh, I've mentioned now a number of times, maybe you get insurance here. Okay, so you can kind of put that in the context of, look, I have objectives, I want to protect my wealth, I want to protect my health, okay, so I can protect my health by, well, accepting the risk of no action, you're just saying I don't care, the outcome, avoid, don't even get in a car, pursue, to protect my health, I'm going to reduce the risk, go on the back roads, and then wealth, well, I'm gonna get some insurance to cover that. So you look at your different objectives, you look at the risk affecting those objectives, and then you take a strategy that'll help you uh, to achieve the entity's objectives within your risk appetite and how you're willing to accept or avoid or pursue these, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and again, uh, here's our point of portfolio. Look, um, again, even though you're looking at these probably by activity, uh, the organization develops an evaluative portfolio entity-wide view of uh, risk. Okay. Now, if there are changes, review and revision, right? Changes, and that's uh, always going to happen, include identifying internal and external environment changes related to the business content as well as change in culture, you know, and you look at that and in the past, you know, you read those things and you think, oh, okay, well, that will happen once every hundred years. Well, guess what? You just lived through a hundred year, you know, change in uh, environmental changes and changes in culture. Okay, so congratulations for living through that, but it does happen and sometimes it happens at a, you know, rate that is you know, almost impossible to fully evaluate, okay? Evaluations may relate to potentially incorrect assumptions, poorly implemented practice, 
And then of course you pursue improvement, okay? And then you have your information communication and reporting component and just uh, looking over at the next page, um, you can see here that, uh, yeah, information technology, okay, is, um, you know, a good way to get the information that you need about various risks. And these days with data analytics and whatnot, you can probably get a, you know, a high level analysis that talks about the impact of different activities, okay? Now you come over and um, we need to um, consider our data management, okay? It is integral to risk management. So data, key data uh, management, data and information governance promotes standardized high quality data, process controls promote data reliability and data management architecture refers to the fundamental design of technology uh, and how that's driven by value defined by management, okay? Now, when we look at reports, and our reports can take a profile view, outlining the severity of the risk at the entity level. It can take a profile view of risk, okay, at different levels, okay? And um, when you take a look at reporting on culture, seeks to the anal analytics of cultural trends, benchmarking to entity standards and uh, compensation schemes, lesson learned analysis. All of these are ways of looking at uh, how there is a impact on the culture. Okay, all right. So let's just go ahead and see how we would answer a couple of questions on the uh, enterprise risk management. Both questions are just one. I mean, the, I'm sorry. Did you put up both questions or just one? Uh, right now, there's only opportunity to respond to one. So I give okay. about two minutes per question. So we're at 153, 56, 58. You, that doesn't mean you can't look at the other question. Uh, two minutes. Okay. So generally, what I'll do is I'll call for, I'll give one last chance. Okay, everybody go ahead, take your choice, which everyone has at this point, because I can see how many people have responded. I end the poll, I share the results. And um, we did very well on this one, right? Um, now I can see, well, let's look at the questions. So then I'm gonna stop sharing the results so we can see the question. And then um, we look at it. And according to the committee sponsoring organization, the Treadway Commission, which of the following components of enterprise risk management address an entity's commitment to 
core values and that was really what the governance and culture a um, couple of us pick d review and revision i mean i guess review and revision can touch any part of this right because if we see issues related to any part of it the review and revision should identify that and feed it back into the process but the best answer is governance and culture here Okay, I could see why I'd say, well, review and revision touches everything, but governance and culture is most directed to the core values. Okay. Okay, good. And I can move up the next question and then let me go ahead and launch the poll again. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and wrap up. Take your choice here. And um, let's share the results. And uh, okay, we want to be, you know, more up around 75 on these. And I guess I'm a little concerned here because I thought this one would be pretty straightforward. So even though most of us got it right, I was looking more for an 80, 90% uh, response to this. Okay, so. Let's look through this one and let's look through it a little bit differently. Um, let's select actions that would fit with the choices. Okay. And so we're going to pretend like this is a task based simulation. And in the task based simulation, they're asking us to select actions that would fit into avoidance, fit into reduction fit into sharing and fit into acceptance. And then we'll see why sharing C was the right answer, I think here. So Able Corporation owns numerous businesses along the coast of Florida. The company's management has identified business interruption events as a potential result from damage caused by hurricanes. Hello, we just had a hurricane in Florida. Why does anybody live there? Okay, now they of course say the same thing about earthquakes, um, but uh, anyway. The company, I guess it has to do with your risk appetite, right? The company elects not to only insure its properties, but buy down standard deductibles with an additional premium. So I pay higher premium. Instead of my deductible being 10,000, my deductible is 5,000, okay? Uh, Abel's response to potential risk is known as, and they want us to line up the action, articulating the question, with these strategies, but I'm going to pretend like there's a drop down that talks about each one of these. Okay, so avoidance would be what? 
move from Florida. Just move. Get your whatever these things are out of the way of the hurricanes. Right? Would be an action to avoid the risk. I mean, it's not written anywhere that they have to have these here. Okay, so they decide to move to Florida out of Florida. Reduction would be what? Well, we're going to move some of our higher valued facilities out of Florida and we'll keep some smaller, less valued. Isn't that a reduction? Would you reduce the risk that way? Okay. Acceptance would be don't do anything except that, you know. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and use a bad word. This is the shit happens approach, right? Hey, you know, I just accept it. Stuff happens. What am I going to do, right? Sharing is what? Getting insurance and trying to what? Trying to limit my exposure even more by paying a higher premium so that the insurance company shares even more of the risk with me, right? I mean, clearly insurance is the sharing, which is why C was the correct choice. So what am I missing? Because I figured we'd be at a 90% on that one. That insurance is the class. Professor, um, I have a question. So what's the difference between reduction and sharing? Again, sorry, I missed that. Reduction, ab avoidance, is zero. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to do. It. I'm not going to drive. Reduction is well. I'm going. It's going to take me longer to get to my destination, but I'm going to drive on the slowest road, where the mm -hmm. speed limit never exceeds 25 uh, degree, 25 miles per hour. Now that doesn't mean that you couldn't die at a 25 mile per hour, but your chances, and they didn't list it here. But um, increasing the risk, right? Pursuing the risk would be, well, I'm gonna get on the freeway because I have to get to my destination. I don't have time to uh, do it. So, you know, um, pursuing the risk would be, well, I'm gonna buy even more plants in the, aisle, in the path of hurricanes because, um, you know, the cost of electricity is less in that area or something stupid like that. And that's worth it to me, right? Um, so, yeah. So reduction is reducing the, the, basically the impact of the bad thing. Sharing is saying, well, I'll take some of the risk, my deductible, but I'm going to try to push off some of that, you know, to the insurance companies by the amount of coverage they give me. And acceptance is doing nothing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can use a combination of these, right? So you could do some acceptance, some sharing, some reduction, some avoidance, do it in different parts of the company. If you pursue avoidance and you say, well, okay, that impacts this part of the company, but what happens? If by moving everything out of Florida, you're now going to impact another part of the company that relies on, you know, that's in Georgia. Well, Georgia's in the past of hurricanes too, but it's closer to Florida. You move everything to Texas, but now you've moved further to Florida and you're impacting another part of the entity. That's that portfolio approach. So you can't just decide for that one line of the business. How does that impact some other part of the business or something? And I'm obviously on the playground of examples at this point. Okay. Okay, good. All right, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the discussion of Sarbanes-Oxley. And, um, you know, I was mentioning Sarbanes-Oxley in another class and then this guy came up to me and said, oh, I remember that um, from a long time ago as though I shouldn't be talking about it. And I'm like, Dude, it's still relevant, okay? I mean, Sarbanes-Oxley was a huge, impactful legislation that a lot of the things that we do are leveraging off of requirements of Sarbanes-Oxley. And as accountants, you know, we are, even though it was back in 2002, we are heavily involved in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act because what it did 
is it established the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which has the responsibility of looking at audit quality over public companies. So we have a whole set of standards that we have to adhere to uh, based on the impact of Sarbanes-Oxley and PCAOB requirements. As accountants, we tend to focus on section four of Sarbanes, or I should, I should say title four of Sarbanes. So when they put a federal law together, they put different titles in there. So we're used to title four and particularly section 404 of title four, which deals with the internal control reporting of entities, right? What we're going to look at here, we'll talk about management's responsibility, yes, under section four, but we start bringing in the discussion of other, we call it section titles for, we'll look at other titles of Sarbanes-Oxley here that relate more to the overall management and corporate governance of the company, okay? So we're really expanding our understanding and our discussion of Sarbanes-Oxley beyond that that we've talked about in the audit course, okay? So key provisions of the act relate to this, uh, Title Three, Title Four, which we're used to. We'll talk a little bit about Title Seven and uh, Title Nine, okay? And the most uh, difficult part of some of those titles is remembering your Roman numerals, okay? All right, so let's just go ahead and take a look at Title Two, okay? And um, public company audit committees. And they tell us that an audit committee is directly responsible for the appointment compensation and oversight of the work of the public accounting firm. So you are hired and fired as an auditor by the audit committee. So you report directly to the audit committee. Audit committee is responsible for resolving disputes between uh, management and the uh, auditor. So really a board of directors and audit committee really is seen as independent, right? From management, if they're gonna be in position for resolving uh, problems, okay? So independence criteria are as follows. And you can see that the audit committee may not accept compensation from the public company, the issuer for consulting or advisory services. The audit committee members may not be affiliated person of the issuer, okay? So um, has the ability to influence financial decisions. Now that doesn't mean that someone from management can't sit on the board of directors, but they can't sit on the audit committee. Audit committee must establish procedures to accept reports of compliance regarding auditing, accounting, internal control, or whistleblower uh, hotlines. And a lot of what you see in Sarbanes-Oxley, you can tie right back to what happened with Enron and in some cases what happened with WorldCom. So those were the two big scandal shenanigans that caused Congress. And really, Congress didn't understand Enron very well. <laughs> WorldCom was so egregious that even a dummy could understand it. And so Congress said, oh, okay, we better do something. So you had Sarbanes uh, in the uh, Senate and you had Oxley in the House, Sarbanes a Democrat, Oxley a Republican, and that's how they were able to get legislation through. That would never happen today. In today's political environment, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to figure this out. Okay, but uh, back then in 2002, although the things were very partisan then too, it, they were at least able to get this out to respond to some things that were going on at that time. Okay, um, just to give you that little background, which I think you probably know, but the whistleblower hotlines were to respond to the fact that there was somebody in Enron that was saying, hey, there's all these problems and, um, you know, they were going unhurt. Okay, um, procedures must accommodate confidential anonymous reports by employees and procedures must accommodate the receipt and retention of complaints as well as a method to address those complaints. You okay? I know we'll get there guys, okay? Hey, look, I, you know, what do you want me to tell you? This stuff, you know, you wanted to be an accountant. I didn't tell you to be an accountant. So some of this stuff is, you know, a bit dry, I get it, right? But don't pass out on me, okay? All right, corporate officials, 
Okay, typically CEO and CFO must sign and certify representations regarding the annual and quarterly reports. So they have reviewed the report. They have to certify that the report does not contain untrue statements. Financial statements are fairly presented. Okay, the CEO and CFO sign a report, make insertions that internal controls have been designed to ensure material information has been made available. Internal controls have been evaluated for effectiveness. Their reports include conclusion as to the effectiveness of the control. And of course, that really pertains to what we're used to under Section 404, where the entity has to provide assurance about their internal control. And of course, the accountant has to uh, certify that. The CEO and CFO signing the report assert that they have made the following disclosures. They have uh, identified significant efficiencies and material weaknesses, right? Terms we learn in auditing and any fraud has been, um, I, has been uh, identified that any fraud that involves management or any other employee with significant role in internal control has been disclosed in the uh, internal control discussion. Okay. Okay, good. Now, this is kind of interesting, and this is a tough one, okay? If an issuer is required to prepare an accounting restatement due to non-compliance with financial reporting requirements and the securities laws, then they could be required to, and they call this disgorgement, they're going to have to give up their bonuses. They would have to give up any gains on the sale of stock uh, within the 12-month uh, period that that uh, reissuance was covering so um yeah that's kind of sorry some more flash carding okay okay good come over looking at title four now and uh, conflict of interest provisions issues are prohibited from making personal loans to directors or executives uh, unless they're in the ordinary course of business and essentially are on the same terms as what they would offer the public. So it doesn't mean that if you're, you know, working for a big company like Visa that you can't get a credit card, right? But they can't give you some special, you know, um, special credit terms or something like that. Okay, that would be conflict of interest for a board member, directors or executive officers. Okay, all right, good. Come over and management assessment of the internal controls. And this is the area that we are most aware of. Trying, is there a question? Now, now she's muted. Okay, so I guess not. Okay, good. Okay, now what happens? Management assessment of the internal controls. And this is what we're most used to under Section 404 uh, of Sarbanes under Title IV, Section 404, in that the entity has to include in their annual report an assessment of their internal controls. And this is where, when I was pointing this out to somebody, they came up to me and said, oh, I remember that. Well, that was, that was way back then. Yeah, but they still have to do it. And it's still a place where you can look to see where they've called out issues with their internal control, which was my whole, whole point of why I was mentioning that in that other class I was teaching. Um, these are non-accountants. So I guess they think because something was a law back in 2002 that you don't have to still do it. Okay, they still have to do it. You can still read that report to see if they've talked about any problems with the internal control. So they have to make a statement that they have assessed the control and they have to say that the controls are effective. And then the auditor has to do what? Has to attest to that assessment about the internal control. And as accountants, as CPAs, types, I think we uh, all understand that very well, okay? Now, there also needs to be a code of ethics for the senior officers of the entity, okay? And so that should also happen, okay? 
and there needs to be disclosure of audit committee financial expert. So there has to be at least one member of the audit committee who should be a financial expert. Financial reports of the issuer must disclose the existence of the financial expert on the committee or the reasons why the committee does not have this financial expert. So you take a look, knowledge, what should the financial expert know about? GAP, experience in auditing, experience in the application of GAP, experience with internal controls, understanding of audit committee functions. Hmm, I wonder if there's some people in here that could serve as the financial expert on a audit committee and a board of directors of a corporation. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, activity that you're training yourself for, right? Okay, so let's just go ahead and flashcard what sort of knowledge that person should have. Okay, but this is the kind of role that they're expecting certified public accountants to step in and fill those roles, guys. Okay, okay, good. Let's come in and then what? Enhanced review of periodic disclosures. We have the SEC and they have to file the 10K and um, they have to have, um, the SEC may review, well, they will review disclosures made by issuers uh, on a regular systematic basis. So that's part of what the SEC does. Um, I'm actually gonna have some speakers from the SEC coming in. And uh, I think I'm gonna probably go ahead and make that our guest speaker assignment. I'm thinking that makes sense. So um, if you can't make it for that next week on the 15th, I will record it. So you can watch it or you can tune in and watch it live. Uh, I'll put up more information about this, including the Zoom link but it's gonna happen at six o'clock next Thursday, next Thursday, July 15th. I'm gonna have SEC come in and talk about their role. And so uh, I'll have that be our guest speaker right up. I'll also have some opportunities for some other ones. I'm working on getting the PCAOB come to speak. I'm also working on getting someone from the State Board of Accountancy to come in and speak. And what they're gonna be talking about is the various activities that they do to ensure that entities are issuing their financial reports correctly, that auditors are doing their work correctly, um, et cetera. So um, there may be more than one opportunity for a guest speaker right up. Maybe I'll let you do some for extra credit too, okay? But that will be coming, so stay tuned for that. There'll definitely be one next week on Thursday. Not tomorrow, but we can. So are G1 asked to write something about them? Yeah, I will give you a series of um, questions that I want you to respond to, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There'll be a kind of a rubric, I guess, for lack of a better, to pick a you know, kind of sophisticated term. Okay, but yeah, I'll give you some questions to respond to, and I'll post those up. But we'll definitely do SEC next week, unless they flake on me and don't show up. <laughs> but I'm hoping they will. Six o'clock next week, we'll know. Okay, but they're saying they're going to come. Okay, all right, good. Um, so the SEC should consider the following that uh, issuers have issued material statements, uh, have issued material statements of financial results, and issuers have the expertise. Uh, Ex expert experience issues that experience significant vol volati volatility in their stock prices. So these are the kinds of things that would lead them to um, want to review sort of like almost like uh, trip wires that will, uh, will invoke an SEC review. So issues have issued material restatements, okay, volatility in their stock prices, right? Um, issuers with large market capitalization, okay, I meaning they have some entities are larger, so they take, basically, I always call these approaches, the correct uh, terminology is risk-based approach, right? I always call it, they're going to look at the biggest and the baddest, biggest, 
those are the largest capitalizations, uh, right? Um, baddest misstatements, okay? Emerging companies with disparities in their price to ratio. Um, most of the time, emerging companies, um, you know, price to earnings ratios, most emerging companies are gonna probably have lower earnings, right? So they might uh, look at that. Issues who operate significant affect, uh, issues who operate significantly affect any material sector of the economy, okay? You know, sometimes I feel like, or a company that even though it's a public company is run by a big mouth. <laughs> so you always end up hearing about SEC is once again, looking at uh, Tesla, da, 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 da. and it's because, you know, someone needs to pull our buddy, uh, what's his name? Elon Musk aside and say, you're dealing with an entity that has no sense of humor, none. They have no sense of humor. You can't walk around saying things that you do without lighting something up and you're a huge, you know, public world renowned figure. You can't walk around saying things. I'm gonna take the private company private and think that that's somehow gonna, the SEC is gonna just go back and say, oh, that's just Elon being Elon. No, you're gonna run into trouble, right? So there's that aspect as, as well, is just the visibility of the company, right? Could also, be a reason that uh, that could fall under some scrutiny from the uh, SEC. Okay, all right, good. Now, let's take a look at some of the criminal penalties and uh, statute limitation of fraud uh, is no later than the earlier two years after discovery of the fact or five years after the violation. So go ahead and flashcard that. Whistleblower protection. Again, can you say Enron? Okay, an employee who lawfully provides evidence of fraud may not be discharged, dismoted, suspended, threatened, or harassed in any manner. Okay, and um, if that's the case, they can file a complaint with the Secretary of Labor. So, Department of Labor actually has some involvement in the callings out of uh, what Sarbanes had. So, it's a very large legislation dealing with many different parts of the federal government, okay? Uh, now, if there is some sort of finding that uh, they were, you know, inappropriately discharged, dismoted, reinstatement with the same seniority status, back pay with interest and compensation for any special damages. And I really don't think that there's anything against a civil action in a situation like this as well. So, um, you know, companies really need to look out for this kind of stuff. So go ahead and flashcard that, okay? And then attempt and conspiracy an individual attempts, conspires to commit any white collar offense will be subject to the same penalties, okay? So it's not enough to say, what well, was John's idea? I was just going along with it. That's called, a consp that's called conspiring. And uh, that's not good. Now, somebody told me the other day that conspiracy was a word that the CIA came up with, that it wasn't a word before and CIA came up with that word. And I'm like, okay, maybe they did, but you do understand that there are situations where groups of people get together to decide to do the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, they've given a word for that. It's called a conspiracy. And conspiracy to commit crime is often uh, as bad as actually doing the crime, okay? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's just take a look at question related to Sarbanes-Oxley. And I'm gonna put the poll up as soon as my cursor stops hiding from me.
Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Okay. And um, the good news is that everyone tried this one. So I know you haven't completely gone to sleep on me because everyone tried this. So that's good. Um, it's good that, um, you know, when we look at the results, we got a good 83% of us, 10 out of the 12 got it correct. The concern I have, and maybe I'm just, you know, being too hard of a coach here, but I wanted 100% off this, okay? Because when I look at this question, you know, what do they expect of a financial expert? You know, limited understanding of generally accepted audit standards is complete nonsense. Education and experience is a certified financial plan. Where? Where did we say anything? That's ridiculous. We never said anything. Now, maybe we got confused and thought we read certified public accountant there. Then that, they couldn't give us that answer because that would be the kind of thing. But certified financial planner, where did we say that? And why would that be the case? Okay. Uh, experience with internal accounting controls. Yeah, we said that. And yeah, I think, you know, financial Experience in the preparation of tax returns. We didn't say that at all. And Sarbanes, honestly, is all about the financial reporting aspect of an entity. It's not their tax compliance components. So um, make sure you're looking at these questions carefully and doing your best to answer them. The battle to passing CPA exam starts here, okay? And trying to do the best you can with these questions. Now, if someone wants to offer a reasoning for B or D, I'm all ears. Nobody chose A. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at the next one. Okay, good. Everyone's had a chance to try this one. And um, okay, we got a good turnout for this question. Um, most of us got it right. The choice is um, C. Okay, and so um, let's just take a look at this. Uh, owning more than 10% of the stock. Well, let me, let me read the question. I'm gonna stop sharing the poll. Let's just look at the question. And conflict of interest provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley generally prohibit the director executive officers owning more than 10% of the common stock. Now, I mean, that happens all the time that there's people on the board of directors that own more than that. How do you think they got on the board of directors? Okay, any form of equity, if A is wrong, B is wrong. Uh, C, 
uh, receiving personal loan, not in the ordinary course of business yet. That was what we called out an ordinary loan or an ordinary credit card or something's okay. Otherwise, for some of these really huge entities, it'd be almost impossible to find enough people that would even go sit on the board of directors because they're in large banks and that kind of thing. Uh, receiving prerequisite compensation. Does anybody know what that is? What is prerequisite compensation? Anybody know? I think it's management perks. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think it's it's like it's it's perks, and I think that the issue is that you have to, you probably can have perks. You can have a company car. You could have a company jet, uh, but you obviously have to pay taxes on it, and you have to deal with it. You have to disclose it, and all that stuff. Okay, because I've looked at. I don't even know what that is. What is Pre perquisite. Oh, perquisite. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm such a, a thing that is required as a prior condition for something else. Did I misspell it? Yeah. You've got the E and the R mixed up. Oh, perquisite. I see. No wonder I was, <laughs> no wonder I didn't know what it meant. Perquisite, I see. That's why they call them management perks. Get it. I, 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 um, I thought I read pre, I read prerequisite. I'm like, what the heck is prerequisite educate? I mean, uh, I know what prerequisite education is. It, it's what, considered part of uh, a manager. If someone is getting perquisite compensation, it's considered part of their overall compensation. And I think taxes need to be paid on that. I think there's a very high profile case going on right now about that in the state of New York. Okay, so conflict of interest provisions generally prohibit directors of executive officers from, and I see, yeah, directors or executive officers. I mean, that sound you hear is, you know, a thousand CEOs and CFOs weeping openly, right? Um, well, so. they can, they, it, they are not uh, prohibited from receiving perquisite compensation, but it just has to be dealt with in a legal fashion. It has to be disclosed. It ha taxes have to be paid on it. It has to be recognized as part of that um, employee's full compensation. Fine, but this question was the key word was prohibit. Right. So it, D is not a correct choice. Right. Okay. So, okay. So, um, yeah, okay, good. I don't think we said that in the outline, but um, we did say this, and I think I had you flashcard that. So um, that's why C was the correct answer. Okay, good. So what we're going to do is stop there because I can't, even though it was part of my goal for tonight, and even though I could fly through it, I think, and get it done. It's gonna probably take us about 20 minutes to wrap it up. Um, I don't wanna you know, push past the time and I don't wanna to try to fly through this. So we're gonna stop there. That means we have covered the first three modules. That means that the expectation is that you would follow the how to study plan now and you would sit there and you would start to look at things like your uh, you'd start to follow the how to study guide and you would make your flashcards you would memorize your flashcards and then you would turn to the b1 multiple choice questions for module one module two module three and then any task-based simulation including the potential for written communication example you should be doing that um, you know starting tomorrow and over the weekend that should all be done by Monday so that on Monday we start module four and so on okay and we'll probably get through uh, chapter one next time covering the remaining modules okay question uh I have a question I saw some live classroom or like webcast on Becker so would you recommend to do it 
Um, well, I think you have to be registered in one of those live online classes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like you can just tune in. And then in terms of the lectures, um, you know, I don't recommend that you watch those lectures because you have this lecture. So if you're going to be watching the pre-recorded national lectures, it begs the question, why are you doing this? I have a question um, about the stuff that you um, highlighted, but we are not flashcarding. You did not mark specifically for flashcarding. Is that stuff that we should still study, but maybe not study as hard as the flashcarded stuff, which needs to be memorized? Is that sort of how your, your thinking is about this? No, I'm highlight some things because if I just went straight to flashcards, it would seem a little disjointed. Um, okay. So if I highlight something, it's probably because it's part of the overall discussion, whereas the flashcards are things that in my sense I can see those translating into homework questions, homework questions into CPA exam questions. Um, so the approach that you should take is to go through, like I say in that how to study plan, quickly going to the things that I've asked you to flashcard, making those flashcards, memorizing those flashcards. Once you memorize the cards, getting into the homework, which are the multiple choice questions, the task-based simulation. Now, when you're going through the material, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. You're going to go, what the F? I don't see anything that represents what we got in the flashcards. Well, you know, I'm not trying to give you 100% flashcard. So for those questions, I would suggest, and when you're in a multiple choice question, you can hit show text. And then it takes you back to the text where that was talked about. You can review it that way. And then you can make a flashcard out of that. So I'm here to get you a good 80% on the flashcards, but by no means are you not allowed to add additional flashcards based on your own personal review of the material. But in terms of sitting there and starting, you know, from module one and watching, you know, Garrity or Olinto or whoever it is, uh, Mark, Mike Brown or whatever his name is sit there and say, okay, what I want you to do now is right over here, all this, and you sit there and do that. I don't recommend that. That's a waste of time. Hello? I have a question too. Yeah. Hello. Um, for the flashcards themselves, you mentioned that Becker provides you with flashcards. The only ones that I saw were like on the digital app. Are they yeah. supposed to actually give us some or are we just referring to the digital app ones? The digital app, it's not Got the hard. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the digital ones. Your generation, I don't think that'll bother you too much. Me, it would drive. So do we have to pay for that? No. No, it's part of the package. How can we get it from the app store? If I got it off the iPhone. Don't buy them. It's part of the package, isn't it? Yeah, it was on, it's just easier. Download the app from the store and it's, your user, your credentials. Uh, there's an app. So you go to the app store, right? Is what you're saying? I'm trying to get to. Yep. The software. Geez, do I have enough windows open? Holy Toledo. <laughs> um, so let me see if I can get to the, I should have just opened a new window. Let's see if I can get to the uh, Becker. Because I guess you can get it on your computer too, right? Oh, I haven't seen, I wasn't able to find them there. But. I don't think it's on the computer. It's on the, um, it's like a all encompassing app, not just the flashcard. Like you can actually do all of this on the app, except for the simulation, I think. Okay. So you have to go to the app store to get it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, scroll down to the bottom of the software. It'll show you too there the link for the app where it says CPA exam review mobile. Then you can get the app from there too as well if you're doing it from your computer. Mm -hmm. Right here. Website browser. And that's where the flashcards are? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So, I mean, to me, there's three universe of flashcards and they overlap a little bit. One is the ones that are in the app store. Two are the ones that I give you. And again, there may be overlap. And then again, there may not be. So if I tell you a flashcard and they don't um, give it to you, then you can add it. What is this? Who circled this? Can you show me where the homework is again? Oops. Yeah, I can in a second, but somebody's showing me the flashcards for BEC are here. Oh. Well, I don't know who circled that. How dare you know more than I do? <laughs> so what happened? You click this and then what? Oh, then you go through them for B1. There they are right there. Oh. So you click that little whoever the wise guy was that circled this incredibly useful information. You go ahead and you click on that flashcard little thing. I thought they were on here somewhere. And then you go to BEC. Is that class we're doing and then yeah. you pick the class you want which of course would be b1 the only problem there is i'm not sure that they're organized by module mm -hmm. um so that might be a little bit problematic and that you'll see flashcards that don't pertain to things yeah uh, that we're talking about so sometimes matt oh thanks matt so oh but at least it talks about um the particular area. And so you should know, even though we'll call it out by module, you should know that we already talked about the COSO framework. So this one would be relevant to what we've been talking about was you're trying to work through these modules. Really, they should organize it by module, but they don't. So you have to kind of read that top thing, but it looks like they kind of are sticking with an order there. So again, um, you know, if I've asked you to make that flashcard, then, and, and it's here, you don't have to remake it. Um, but sometimes I've got a different sense about some things, you know, I've been around, you know, <laughs> so, you know, there are some things that I feel like, okay, you got a flashcard this. So, um, add those to these flashcards. Matt, is there a way to, um, add a flashcard here? Maybe Matt's microphone was turned off because he was making marks on here. There may even be some ways to, um, sorry, my mic don't work. <laughs> okay. Um, is there a way to add a card? I don't think you can add a card. Okay. So you're going to have to add them. You know, you can't add them here, but you'd have to add them manually. So you'll have some that are over here on the computer. You'll have another stack over here that are the ones that I asked you to make. And then the third universe of flashcards, and I know that I'm jumping all over the place, but at least I know where I'm going. The three universes, the ones that are here, the ones that I asked you to make, and again, there may or may not be an overlap there. And then the third universe are those that you're like sitting here going, I don't know how to answer this question. Is there a Becker flashcard that addresses this? If not, and John didn't tell me to make one, let me make one. So now you have three you know, groups of flashcards, your ones that you made, the ones that I told you to make that weren't Becker ones are sitting over here in hard copy. The others are either on your app or uh, here on your computer. Huh? Okay. But I want to add, you can actually take notes um, while you're taking the like the quizzes and print the notes out, you know, as like a flashcard kind of deal where um, if you find something that we don't have flashcard. Okay, so when you say the quizzes, I'm assuming and Yeah, and then you could do the little like the... Can I show where the homework is again? So let where me. Did you, where did you find that? I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't see. That was where. So I'd go to B1. B1, yeah. and then it's by module. Okay. And you just click with what you want to work. I'm clicking resume session because I had started that when we were working with this the other day. And then you can go to the little pencil with the paper on the left side, and then you can take notes on here and print it out. 
um, that's what I do. And print it out. Okay, well, whatever works for you. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what you would write and why you'd print it out, but I do not to stop you if you think you have a that you have something that was useful to you there. Okay. And then the other thing you can do when you're in a question, since we're going through this, um, then you can, um, where is it? Somewhere on here, there's a place where you can walk, you can go back to the textbook, right? Yes, it's a C lecture. Huh? On the left side, on the left top, C lecture. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, right there. See lecture, and then you can go and you can click on that, and they're going to probably start babbling here. Um, and then you hit play. But again, you know, I think this should be more an exception basis than watching the whole lecture from start to finish because you're going to see. The C in Evoca, commitment to confidence. We want to make sure everybody we employ, hire is confident. We want to hire them, develop them, retain them. Competent employees, as well as competent consultants, advisors, board members, it goes across the board, okay? Anyone we do business with in terms of providing us services, we want to make sure they're competent. And then the A in Evoca is accountability. Okay. I mean, if that turns you on, go for it. Um, to me, I, that drive, would drive me nuts. Um, you know, um, I think there should be something more than just telling you where to write down the elements of a mnemonic that they gave us a page that had that mnemonic already that we just flashcarded, we memorized it and we moved on, you know, then to me, they, you know, don't go through and talk about, you know, um, hey, you missed this question and you missed this question because you didn't know what prerequisite meant or, you know. So, I mean, you know, I think that you're, you know, you're better off if you're going to sit through here. I don't think you want to watch that whole lecture, but it could help you to understand why one of the questions was, you know, what it was um, by, by hitting that, that particular feature. Okay. When are you going to post uh, the the uh, today class on Zoom? Uh, Excuse me. I should be able to get to it tomorrow. I, I got it. Thank you. And approximately, how long should we be spending on each question? Is it basically a minute on each question, or? Um. The first time you do them, I don't care how long you spend on each one. And that doesn't mean that you should, you know, start a question, read it, go take a nap, cook dinner, <laughs> come back, you know. Yeah, like no, I, I, yeah. So there should be a sense of purpose to get through these. But in terms of how long it takes you to get through any one question, I'm not particularly interested at this time. I'm okay. more interested in accuracy than I am speed. So if you look at that how to study file, I don't talk about trying to get through each question in two minutes or something. Um, I kind of practice with that here with you a little bit more than anything because we don't have all day to sit here and look at these questions. But as you're learning the material, um, you know, it should probably take you four, uh, eight hours per chapter to get through everything four hours reviewing the material and making the flashcards and memorizing them, four hours working the multiple choice questions. Uh, we'll build in the test basement, doing actually doing the homework. We'll build speed as we um, go into the final review stage of things. Now, when you speak to chapter, are you speaking to module or are you speaking to like B1 of six? B1 of six, chapter. Okay. Chapter. We'd be here forever if it was four, four, you know, four, eight hours per module. <laughs> uh, four hours per chapter. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. You know, and that's a rough estimate. Um, you know, not four hours, excuse me, eight hours. 
you know, if it takes you 10, okay, I'm not tripping. If it's taken you, you know, and I've had students over the years tell me, it takes me 20 hours to go through a chapter. And I'm like, bullshit. Okay, if you're spending 20 hours on one of these chapters, you're not really studying that full 20 hours. You're yelling at the kid, you're yelling at the significant other, you're staring at the TV half the time, you know, you're taking a nap in the middle of that. Um, so if as someone starts to run into a time that takes more than 10 hours, then I wanna take a look at your study habits and see what's going on there and see if we can't identify where maybe there's some inefficiencies that have crept into the study process. So eight to 10 hours. That's still a lot, guys. I mean, we, that's, you know, that's between 20, 15 to 20 hours a week outside of class doing this stuff, right? Because we cover maybe two, one to two. Well, maybe it's more like 10 hours outside of class because we cover more like one chapter per class for a week, per week of class. So that's, that's a lot of work, okay? The other thing, you should be registering for the exam. There's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't be have registered. Well, unless you're not eligible to sit yet, but assuming you're eligible to sit, you need to be registering for that exam. Question? Okay, guys, good work. Keep up the attendance. Uh, I've already got a list of people that I'm gonna be reaching out to to see where they were today. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stay on you about being in class. Okay, guys. Thanks, bye. See you soon. All right, see you Monday. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye, guys.